Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Joint Office of Energy and Transportation webinar, where we're going to be covering what's in store for 2024. Uh, just letting participants join here, and we'll go ahead and get started in just a second. Hi again, everyone. We've crossed the uh, threshold mark of 100 participants still uh, inching our way up. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Steve Lomley. I'm the Communications and Education Lead for the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. And today we've got a great webinar for you um, focused on what's in store for 2024. I'm going to cover a few housekeeping uh, notes here. Um, first of all, uh, controls are located at the bottom of your screen. Um, if they aren't appearing, you can move your cursor over the bottom edge of the screen. Um, and I want to call attention to this because we are going to be using the Q&A feature uh, to field your questions um, during our Q&A portion of today's webinar. So you'll see uh, an icon with two chat boxes that says Q&A and um, would encourage you to go ahead and submit your questions there uh, throughout the webinar. And especially during the uh, panelist discussion that we've got at the end. Um, so that's how we'll be fielding your questions. I uh, just want to offer up a disclaimer. A disclaimer uh, the webinar is being recorded and may be posted on the Joint Office website or used internally. If you do speak during the webinar or use your video, you are presumed to consent to recording and use of or your voice or image. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of our agenda today, we've got some uh, great panelists. We're going to start out with some introductory, introductory remarks by our executive director, Gabe Klein, and then uh, introduce you all to uh, our senior advisors. So we've got Sajal Shaw, Senior Advisor for Electric Utility Programs and Policies, Kevin George Miller, Senior Advisor for Operating Models and Finance, and Deb Schirmer, our Senior Advisor of Community and Urban Charging. Um, and then we'll have a panel discussion and audience Q&A at the end. Next slide, please. Uh, first, we've got a couple of polling questions just to get a sense of uh, who's on the webinar today. So uh, Derek, if you could go ahead and show the first polling a question. Um, we're interested in understanding what region of the country you're from. Uh, helps us just kind of gauge um, where representation is from. So go ahead and answer that question. Um, we'll give you just a, a minute here. Derek, when we've got a critical mass, if you could go ahead and show us the results, please. Great. Wonderful to see folks from all over the country um, and good representation from the Northeast, the West uh, as well. Um, go ahead and close that one and we'll move on to the next polling question, please. And then we're understanding, uh, interested in understanding what sector you're from. So are you um, a government representative, uh, one of our utility partners uh, or stakeholders um, from the industry? If you could go ahead and answer these questions and then Derek, and we've got a Critical mass, if you could go ahead and show us the results, please. Great. Um, wonderful to see a whole bunch of folks from the EV industry. Uh, I know you all joined us for many of these calls, and then we've got uh, participants from state, local, and federal government as well. Uh, so thanks so much, Derek, for showing those poll questions. And with that, we'll go ahead and move to the next slide, please. All right, so um, I already mentioned, these are the folks we've got on the call today. We're going to kick things off with Gabe Klein, our executive director of the joint office, and then we'll um, hear quick updates from each of our senior advisors. And after that, we'll go ahead and uh, open it up for a panel discussion where I'll be moderating and ask, asking some questions. Again, just a reminder uh, to submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, there is a chat feature as well, although uh, we will be using the Q&A feature. So with that, next slide, please. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Executive Director Gabe Klein, who is going to uh, just refresh your memory on who and what the Joint Office is and then some of the exciting things that we've been working on. Take it away, Gabe. Thank you, Steve. and. Uh... Uh, thanks to the whole team, um, the engagement, uh, education, and communications team. They do a spectacular job. Um, and I'm very excited to have this webinar for a couple of reasons. One is to kick off uh, calendar year 2024. 
um, with a bang and talk about, you know, a little bit about what's transpired just in the first month uh, and then talk about what's coming. And it'll be a portion of it because there's so much going on now that we're about 40 people in the joint office, um, but also to highlight the work of our senior advisors. Um, and they are just amazing folks that are helping us to meet our vision and mission every single day. Uh, they were handpicked to, to do this work. And so I'm really excited um, for you to hear directly from them. Uh, next slide. And, uh, you know, this is a little bit of a summary of our primary programs that we're supporting. Of course, if you look at the bipartisan infrastructure law and you look at the MOU that the secretary signed, there are a lot of um, sub elements uh, to the work that we do. Um, but we uh, are very busy uh, with the NEVI uh, plan and program. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Uh, the charging and fueling infrastructure grants, of which the first two of five years were just announced about 10 days ago, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and more and more, the LONO program at USDOT for transit buses um, and the clean school, school bus program at EPA. I was listening to NPR, uh, I think it was yesterday, and uh, was hearing about this program. There was a billion dollars, by the way, given out last Monday. And the fact that 25 million people, uh, children, uh, use these buses every single day. So it's the number one form of uh, transit. Um, next slide. So here's a little bit of, of a summary of what, what's happened over the last month or so. Um, we had a slew of uh, station openings uh, in December, um, Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania, the connector standard. Um, uh, came out um, from SAE. We had the CFI, the RAA, and the Joint Office photo selections. And we have slides that will go into more detail. These are actually photos of us. Gosh, I guess this is just like last week um, at the, or maybe it was the week before, at the auto show, um, announcing it, both deputy secretaries and myself, announcing the uh, uh, repair and replace program, the $148 million program. Uh, next slide. Here's some pictures of those openings. I will say I was at the London, Ohio opening with Governor DeWine, uh, Andrew Rogers, others, uh, Alex Schroeder from our team. And uh, it was a beautiful station. Um, it was interesting because we're in the parking lot uh, of a gas station and Caddy Corner is the new GM Energy uh, station with the giant canopy. And it it really looked amazing. It, it was a, a pilot location because it was literally the same canopy, maybe a little bit nicer actually, um, but it put it on equal footing uh, with, with the gas station. Uh, Rachel was in Kingston, New York, um, announcing uh, that station with Shaylin Bat, uh, and then Pitts in Pennsylvania came online, another GM Energy site. So we have 33 states that have released their uh, uh, solicitations, 13 states have issued awards or have agreements in place. And then we have the three that have opened and there's many more coming online this quarter. Uh, construction's actually underway for stations in Hawaii, Maine, Rhode Island and Vermont and props to Hawaii who has not had an easy year uh, and they are rocking and rolling there. Uh, next slide. So the discretionary uh, CFI program uh, we had $623 million awarded uh, about 10 days ago. Um, you can see the numbers there, uh, 47 projects, 22 states and Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico got a, a pretty exceptional uh, grant. We're very excited for them. And that's going to result in about 7,500 EV charging ports. Uh, it's a mix um, uh, between level two uh, and DC fast charging ports. Uh, and look for another uh, tranche of that, the third year tranche coming very soon. Uh, next slide. Uh, just last Friday, um, the joint office actually made our uh, funding awards for the ride and drive electric funding opportunity it was $46.5 million. Uh, this funding is going to support 30 really awesome projects. Um, we consider them EV charging game changers. 
Um, and it's going to address specific needs, addressing barriers to charging in multifamily housing facilities. And as more and more people are buying EVs, the, the early adopters, many of them were in single family homes. <clears throat> as we see, you know, as we hit almost 10% uh, sales in uh, December, we're mainstreaming and we have everybody uh, uh, buying, including people in urbanized areas, people in multifamily homes, some in, in, in urbanized areas also. We're also exploring uh, new approaches to curbside charging, including bring your own court, which I think is very exciting. Uh, promoting seamless connections across modes through e-mobility hubs and testing new incentive structures to provide affordable uh, public charging access. And of course, creating jobs and creating generational wealth opportunities for entrepreneurs. So very excited about all of that. Uh, by the way, all those awards are on our website. This is a map uh, of where the awards um, where the awards are. Uh, and you can go to our website and you can actually see each award uh, and look at each project. Um, the color gradient is an indication of how much funding uh, went to a particular state. But keep in mind that some of the awardees were cities, many were private companies in partnership with government. Uh, and that's one of the differences with our FOA is that we could award uh, to the private sector as well uh, in partnership with other organizations and governments. Next slide. Uh, and then this is something we came up with, gosh, I don't know, it was the last year, I remember pitching uh, the secretaries on this, but um, we knew that there were a substantial number of ports down. We've been putting in chargers in this country for about 15 years, uh, 16 years maybe. Um, and the first generation, second generation, Many of them were just at the end of their useful life. Uh, some of them were not under contract anymore, so nobody owned them. And so this was an opportunity um, to help states, uh, local jurisdictions to replace those. Uh, there were 24 awards in 20 states, uh, 14 state departments of transportation, as well as 10 local governments or entities. Um, this is gonna replace or repair nearly 4,500 charging ports and modernize the network to meet the current NEVI standards uh, and the demand that we uh, see out there. Next slide. Um, in terms of what is to come from the joint office, uh, the NEVI program continues to um, progress and grow. Uh, we have a lot of states in different places. Some like Ohio had already done a tremendous uh, amount of planning uh, they were really leaning in even before this program. Others are just getting their planning underway. Uh, but we're starting to see chargers go in the ground, which is very exciting. Um, with the 10% set aside, the RAA that, that, that was just awarded, uh, ARFOA and so forth, some of that's going to move faster because you have a lot of level two chargers. It's not as much of a construction project. Um, and, and with the uh, RAA, it's more about swapping chargers in and swapping other chargers out. Now that uh, the CFI awards have been made and we have more local jurisdictions, towns, cities, Indian tribes um, that have been awarded funds, we are ramping up our technical assistance led by Linda Bailey, uh, who came to us from DC government and from NACTO. Um, so she is ramping up uh, with Jeff Peel and the whole team to support local jurisdictions, which in some ways is a much bigger undertaking uh, because there are 50 states, but there are literally thousands of towns and cities. Um, we're going to be launching the EV chart uh, platform. And that's very exciting. That's going to ingest all the data from, or much of the data from Title 23 projects funded by the federal government, federal highways, DOT, uh, Fort Chargers. Um, that's launching actually in the next month. Um, and then building out our zero emission freight vehicle corridor strategy. Um, you might hear more about that. I think you will from Kevin on this call. He's been working a lot on that. And the last thing that's not on here, um, but I'll just mention, is that we've been working a tremendous amount um, on the J3400 standard and making sure that we coalesce with the private sector and help them 
or I should say, help them as they coalesce around a charging standard, which was the NAC standard is now becoming an open standard, J3400. And so working with industry, uh, working with NGOs, um, working through our ChargeX consortium and so forth uh, to make sure that we have the most interoperable, resilient, uh, and reliable and usable uh, system nationally. And our goal is for everybody to be able to charge their vehicle at really any charger that they go to through an interoperable system. And it does feel like we are coalescing around uh, a standard. And so we are working um, actively led by uh, uh, our team, uh, Sarah Heipel and Jacob and all of the great standards and reliability folks that are not the focus of this um, webinar, but know that a lot of technical work uh, is happening behind the scenes. Uh, and that's it for me. And now I'm going to turn it over to my friend and senior advisor, Sajel Schott, to talk to us about what she's been working on and what she will be working on this year. Thanks, Gabe. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm Sajel Shaw with this. I'm a senior advisor working on electric utility programs and policies for the joint office. Next slide, please. Uh, so why does the joint office need an advisor on electric utility programs and policies? Well, the electric utility ecosystem is very complicated um, and has many stakeholders that have an impact on how EVs will interact, integrate, connect uh, with the electric grid. And we've already seen that with uh, from the federal side with the bipartisan infrastructure law, which gave us NEVI, CFI, and the joint office. We wouldn't be here if that hadn't been there. So uh, the stakeholders that I focused on over the last six months uh, with the joint office uh, have been the electric utilities themselves and the electric utility regulators. Um, and these conversations have been to help understand their experiences with electric transportation. What are the challenges? What are best practices that can be shared uh, across the nation, across to other entities so that we can start leapfrogging hopefully um, and on the electric utility regulator side, uh, we're engaged with NARUC, both from a leadership conversation standpoint, so that uh, regulators, utility commissioners, and on the federal side, DOE and joint office leaders are able to understand the respective efforts underway and understand the pain points and potentially of where we could assist each other. Um, and then at the staff level, we are having conversations on a monthly basis with utility commission staff joint office and DOE staff to get into the weeds on various uh, uh, topic areas. On the electric utility side, we're engaging through industry organizations like NRECA, APA, EEI, EPRI, and lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations with electric utility staff, um, whether it's virtual or at conferences. Uh, so if you would like to have a conversation about your experiences related to ET, please reach out. Love to have that conversation. Uh, next slide, please. And then a, a quick look at what uh, our key priorities are for going forward for 2024. Uh, stakeholder engagement, which I highlighted in the previous slide, is key. Uh, we need, we are looking to build on that, uh, those relationships and continue that and broaden that across the various other stakeholders mentioned on that slide. Uh, the next priority is to decrease the time it takes for an EVSE to connect to the electric grid uh, with a goal of 500,000 500, public chargers by 2030 and funding programs like NEVI and CFI at the federal level plus funding opportunities from states and utility programs for make ready infrastructure for EV chargers. We're seeing a large number of uh, potentially service load requests um, applications going in at a given time. And I've heard as long as 18 to 24 month timelines for getting chargers energized. So where can we assist and how can we assist to get that timeline shortened so that EV chargers come online faster? Uh, an approach I want to highlight here is uh, our joint office web-based tools that are supported by our amazing data analysis team. Uh, an example is the Guide to Utility Services tool called GUS, which I love the acronym. Uh, it's been beta tested and we're looking to have this widely deployed. Uh, the tool provides not only the availability of electric capacity at a particular location, 
but along the AFCs, but also provides the availability of facilities nearby. So if there's restrooms and lighting and whatnot, it's a great tool. Please reach out if you want to get engaged in that effort and learn more about it. Uh, the next priority is EVs becoming a benef beneficial resource for the electric grid. And that is a huge undertaking. And I'll speak on that a little more in the Q&A side. But uh, I do want to um, unpack one thing here, and that's EV smart charging, because that is a near-term benefit uh, that we can take advantage of from EV smart charging. It helps to avoid grid congestion during peak use periods. And for that to happen, we need to have the EV communicating properly with the EV charger and then have that EV charger or the data properly communicating with the utility side. We have a rock star team uh, here, uh, the standards and reliability team that Gabe previously mentioned that's been working on this for the past year and continuing more work on that this coming year. Uh, the last priority I would like to mention is citing transmission lines and renewables and transportation rights of way. Um, this was the task that was assigned to us by the BIL. Uh, we began efforts on this last year and we're working towards a public engagement in the next few months. So more to come on that uh, very soon. Uh, so I will leave it there and uh, thank you for joining and Kevin, pass it off to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, I'm super excited to be here talking with you. And every time I get to hear you about what Sajel's working on, I get very stoked. Um, I will spend a couple minutes talking to you about what we're doing in 2024 from uh, my bailiwick. Um, I think just for context, as we all know, there's been unprecedented improvements in, in technology to, to battery and infrastructure capabilities that are being embraced by the auto industry drivers, fleet operators, fueling providers, and energy markets. And so the federal programs that uh, uh, many of us have been talking about for a while are, are ramping up now and increasing scale and clip at just the right time, right? More than $50 billion in programs authorized in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, critical tax provisions in the IRA, like the uh, recently released 30C Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Tax Credit. So all these pieces are going to really help catalyze growth in uh, EVs, EV charging, um, and uh, throughout the entire economy. I'll talk to you about two issues I've been working on that are going to uh, get that jump start, um, and uh, we'll go into it right now. So uh, the first is uh, sustainable operating models uh, for EV charging. So the Joint Office and Argonne National Lab have undertaken a comprehensive analysis of the business and operating models for EV charging by both public sector and private sector entities. We're really trying to demystify the economics of operating EV chargers for passenger and fleet vehicles, uh, both by, again, public and private sector entities. It's agnostic as to who it's uh, coming by. Uh, and look, no two entities are alike. No two deployments are alike for EV charging. Um, that said, what we're seeking to do is to shed light on the core drivers of EV charging operations, sensitivities to those drivers, and, and what are barriers to operational uh, sustainability? Uh, what are those different operating models and archetypes? How can we get some common key takeaways? Uh, what are those barriers to long-term operations? And what are the tools in our toolkit to help overcome any barriers or even just accelerate that rollout? Um, so we're uh, really excited to be creating clearer understanding for stakeholders, for policymakers, for regulators at the local, state, and federal level um, to understand why EV charging uh, operations and sustainability are important and, and why sustainability in one context might look different than in another. Um, all of those uh, billions of dollars that we all have uh, talked about and that I just mentioned um, can be uh, strengthened and uh, put to best use uh, if we're able to uh, both meet the market where it is and help uh, triage and uh, catalyze growth in the ways that it needs to uh, be fully um, uh, sustainable uh, and provide uh, uh, ubiquitous access across the board. Um, this will uh, help the market develop, um, and it will also give us visibility into what are the ways in which uh, there's the best opportunity for long-term sustainable operation. How can we skate to where the puck is? Right? And then also, it helps provide that body of knowledge on the economics and of the specific capital expenditure, those upfront capital costs, the CapEx, 
as well as the ongoing operating cost barriers, um, the cost to keep the chargers running and plugged into the grid, uh, which can often be uh, the, the larger hurdle to cover. Um, it gives a better sense of what those actual barriers on the ground are, how they differ in different environments, um, and uh, how we can make sure that anything that we're doing to support from a policy, programmatic, or perhaps more importantly, uh, uh, for uh, creating opportunities for uh, joint ventures between uh, uh, public and private entities, uh, private and private entities, uh, showing where uh, additional uh, partnerships can help make this work, whether or not there is a federal program. So how do we make sure that we're uh, taking the market where it is and uh, helping and providing that support um, uh, to accelerate that growth? So uh, we're really excited to dig into this, to share some of our, our findings and thoughts, and to really engender a conversation. So I uh, hope this is the first of uh, many discussions we get to have on that topic. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So the next piece is, uh, it's frankly a no-brainer, right? Dramatic emissions reductions are necessary to reach all kinds of goals, environmental goals, uh, uh, sustainability goals, uh, economic-wide goals, uh, uh, job creation goals. The auto industry is already going this way. How do we make sure we're creating more opportunities uh, across the board, across all vehicle classes, and across the ones that are in all of our communities, regardless of whether you uh, uh, own a vehicle? We want to make sure that the joint office is uh, supporting riding and driving electric, but we also have to make sure that it's helping folks haul electric, too. Right? Every year, vehicles transport 11 billion tons of freight, um, traveling more than 3 trillion vehicle miles. 5% of all vehicles uh, are medium and heavy-duty vehicle classes, but they contribute 25% of all emissions. So we're uh, excited to help uh, support uh, a pathway and charting uh, a national vision for uh, making sure that we're supporting not just electric, right, but zero emission um, medium and heavy duty vehicle uh, uh, adoption for both hydrogen uh, and EVs. And so I'll, I'll briefly just state that the way that we're thinking about this is we need to focus both on the fuel as well as fleet fundamentals. So in terms of fuel, um, on the hydrogen side, if you missed it last fall, the U.S. Department of Energy announced $7 billion dollars uh, to launch seven regional clean hydrogen hubs, or H2 hubs. Uh, these will really kickstart a national network of clean hydrogen producers, consumers, you know, infrastructure, which will support production, storage, delivery, and end use, including for transportation. Um, so this is going to be key, making sure we have that uh, supply will be key to making sure that it can be used for a variety of uses that are renewable, good for the grid, and good for transportation purposes, because there are going to be some use cases where hydrogen makes sense, makes the most sense. There are other use cases where electricity makes the most sense. Seventy-five percent of all fleets of uh, class, I think, three to eight have uh, duty cycles, so they're, uh, they're typical use uh, uh, patterns have at least six hours of, of time when they're not being used. Those are perfect times to uh, electrify, and uh, we need to make sure that we've got the uh, capacity at the grid uh, to support that. And we need to make sure that as the federal government, we're providing insight visibility and helping partner with local, state, and regional actors to ensure that uh, from uh, the grid side, uh, both from a generation, transmission, and distribution, uh, that capability is there so that as the market is continuing to embrace uh, these uh, zero emission technologies, um, it's able to do so with uh, the uh, least amount of lag time possible. So uh, I'll end with saying, you know, the way that we get to a rapid, uh, sustainable, and scalable growth in uh, decarbonizing zero emission uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles is to focus on fleet fundamentals. What I mean by that is that outside of an economics 101 textbook, fleet operators are the only example in the real world of a rational economic actor. Right? So a rational uh, actor uh, is going to try uh, to work backwards from a couple of questions as they're thinking about how do I operate my fleet? What's the least amount of fuel I need and what's the cheapest time and place to do it? So um, the extent to which we're able to meet fleets to where they are, uh, regardless of whether they're a last mile fleet, uh, whether they're long haul, on road or non road, there are opportunities uh, to decarbonize, to electrify. And uh, if we look at those 75% of class three to eight vehicle segments that have that six hour 
uh, downtime per day. Um, you know, that means if we look at short haul and, and regional, those are low hanging fruit. How do we make sure we can uh, pick that fruit? Don't let it rot on the vine um, while still pursuing the long term goal to ensure rapid scalable growth across all kinds of use cases for fleets. So there's a lot more to unpack here. We're really looking forward to seeing how we can play a supportive role, partnering with all of our colleagues at DOT, DOE, uh, EPA, FMCSA, you, know, you name it, the alphabet soup. There's a lot of interested parties trying to see how we can ha- make this work, and, and we're really excited to lean in on it. So I will end there and uh, pass it on to Debs. Um, Debs, take it away. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks so much, everyone, uh, for joining us today. My name is Deb Schrimmer. And I'm the senior advisor for community and urban charging, and I'm really excited to talk about the year ahead. Um, As Gabe mentioned in his opening remarks, there's been a ton of exciting momentum around the NEVI program supporting corridor charging uh, in the last couple of months. But with the start of 2024, with the announcement of the CFI program and the joint office uh, ride and drive funding opportunity, I would argue that 2024 is proving to be the year of community charging, and I think that's only gonna continue. Can we go to the next slide? Great. So I think first it'd be really helpful to set a little context and talk about how the joint office thinks about community charging. For us, this really refers to all of the different ways an individual might charge uh, their vehicle at the local level, whether that's at home, at work, while they're out spending money at shops and restaurants, Um, or even a quick top up when they're trying to get uh, from A to B. So uh, what we're looking at right here is um, some findings that come out of uh, NREL's 2030 National Charging Network Study, which estimates the um, national EV charging network and expects that we will need around 28 million ports to support light duty electric vehicles on the road in 2030. And I think what's important to highlight here is to meet those needs, NREL actually expects that only about 20% of the charging network will be DC fast charging, and the remainder of the network will come from a variety of other uh, different levels and charging types. And then if we go to the next slide, you'll see that that breakdown of charging really depends on the community type and its different land uses. So for example, you'll see that in the urban areas, DC fast charging is the largest share due to the space constraints and just generally less available home parking of urban residents. But we also know that fast charging has a massively outsized um, share of total costs uh, compared to other levels of charging. And that's due to things like intensive uh, trenching and construction costs or um, hardware costs and the infrastructure and grid upgrades associated with installing DC fast charging. So we know that our grid simply can't support a network entirely of DC fast chargers. And that means on how can we support a variety of charging types, charging levels, and different operating models um, for charging that can help speed up the deployment times associated with them. Next slide. So how are we doing that? Um, you know, first I want to go back to Gabe's mention earlier in this talk about the Joint Office's Ride and Drive funding program that we announced uh, awards for last week. One of those specific topics was focused on community-driven models for EV charging deployment, and the funded projects covered a lot of ground um, on different projects. You know, for example, equitable charging and addressing barriers to residents in multifamily housing who might lack access to a garage and being able to charge there. Uh, So some of the projects that we look at there um, include how we can support subsidized charging rates for income qualified individuals who rely on public charging, which can be more expensive than home charging. Uh, We also support projects that work directly with site hosts and property managers to actually make it easier to install charging at multifamily housing properties. And then we're also looking at um, new models to provide curbside charging uh, to residents that uh, may rely on uh, on street parking. Another topic that we looked at was around how to extend e-mobility charging and access to individuals who don't own cars. And this is a really important topic area um, that ties back to the joint office's mission of making it possible for everyone to not only drive electric, 
but ride electric and recognize that uh, many individuals will uh, enjoy the benefits of zero emission mobility, not through personal car ownership, but through modes like transit and shared mobility uh, modes. So some of those projects in include um, transit and school bus electrification, as well as supporting electrified ride hail services, um, supporting electrified car share and trying to understand, you know, how can we create better economics to run those programs, as well as the mobility hubs. And if we could go to the next slide, I just wanted to tease a couple of things we're really excited about um, to go deeper on supporting community charging uh, for the year ahead. So first, um, the joint office is going to be publishing a white paper focused on uh, emerging best practices surrounding multifamily, multimodal, and curbside charging. We've heard uh, across the board from cities, MPOs, even at the state level, uh, that there's a lot of interest in providing charging in these use cases, but not a lot of understanding on what those best practices um, are. So this will be a resource to really help um, provide insight on how to implement these projects, drawing on case studies from around the country, but also case studies from Europe, where European cities have not only more years of experience deploying EV charging, but experience supporting EV charging um, at a higher level of market adoption and sort of address some of the issues that happen with the scale as more EVs um, are on the road. Uh, and I think this is really exciting um, and speaks to the value that the joint office can bring in helping share best practices and topics and work with communities to understand how these concepts can actually translate into projects for uh, the various federal funding programs that are out there right now and programs that we help support. So I'll stop there and we can dive into the question and answers. Thanks so much, Debs, uh, and to Kevin and Sajel and Gabe as well for providing us with that uh, great information. As Debs mentioned, we are going to dive into the Q&A portion of our webinar. We've got about uh, 20 or so minutes uh, for that. Um, so I'd like to just kind of start off and maybe to take a step back. I thought it would be great for everyone to hear a bit more from each of the senior advisors about why you joined the joint office and what experiences you bring with your background. So if you could each maybe take two minutes for that and we'll start with Sajel. Sure, thanks Steve. Um, so I come from both a regulatory and utility background. Uh, prior to the joint office, I was with the electric utility up in the Northeast and prior to that I was a regulator uh, for a Northeast state. Uh, as far as what, you know, that experience, it's on the ground experience of how folks are dealing with electric transportation. And I think the joint office uh, props to Gabe and team for pulling together a group of folks that have that on the ground experience in all of our teams uh, to supply to the work that we're doing. Uh, so for me, with that electric utility experience, I've worked on uh, with multiple fleets uh, to help them electrify uh, and on the regulatory side with trying to figure out how to make air quality uh, better uh, in that state. So it is uh, very important and uh, glad I'm here with the joint office with a great group of folks. Uh, Kevin, I'll hand it off. Um, I feel lucky. I feel like I've only been here for a couple minutes, but I've been with the joint office since April. The time flies by. There's just, it's such a, a passionate group of people uh, working on some of the most exciting topics that I think are, are, are out there in policy. Um, so I, I come to the joint office with a variety of different experiences. Um, my first roles in state policy were uh, in the Northeast uh, in a state legislature. Uh, so I've had some experience on that side uh, supporting uh, an elected official. I've uh, bounced around uh, from state and federal campaigns back into state government on the executive branch side, um, working on uh, finance for uh, energy and environmental agencies for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and uh, before the joint office, I spent seven years as a uh, a member of the policy team for ChargePoint, an EV charging solutions provider. Um, I had the opportunity to work on local, state, federal, international um, policy issues at a time when the market was really starting to mature. And uh, it was 
fun to be in those Wild West days where I was the only person who would uh, care about the issue uh, in a state. So I'd walk into a state house, and um, if there was someone who wanted to hear about it, I was the only game in town, right? So, you know, that was uh, an exciting time. It was Greenfield, um, but this is the more exciting time. Like, so I, I've had the opportunity to work on some you know, fundamental uh, uh, pieces of legislation and, and policy development um, uh, regionally in the Northeast, you know, working on electricity rate uh, issues uh, uh, in New York, Massachusetts, and, and elsewhere, um, but then also trying to think through the nitty-gritty of, you know, how do you make state agency operations or federal agency operations more conducive to supporting electrification? So we could uh, uh, apply all these things uh, in, in a variety of ways. There's lots of opportunities to pull from, you know, legislative, regulatory, uh, and market uh, issues because all of a sudden now that – you know, all those market factors are coming to bear. The technology capabilities are there. Um, small issues that w wouldn't have caused a blip uh, a year ago all of a sudden have massive implications. Um, so I feel like all uh, uh, of the experiences that I've had thus far were training for this moment right now, and I'm really excited to be here and contributing to uh, uh, the team and to uh, work with all, all my colleagues here. Thanks, Kevin. How about you, Debs? Yeah, um, so my career has really been focused on transportation, and I think that uh, the transportation electrification space, particularly at the federal level, is, is really, as, as Kevin said, like the most exciting place to be right now. Um, you know, what really inspired me was seeing some of the truly historic and unprecedented levels of funding um, to support transportation electrification that came out of uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law. And, you know, that sort of signaled to me uh, a really unique moment to um, not just electrify the existing transportation network that we have today, but use this as a moment to um, reimagine and, and redesign it and make sure that, um, you know, we're future proofing it and incorporating uh, other modes of transportation and addressing historic inequities in the system we have today. So um, that really encouraged me to think about an opportunity with the federal uh, government and particularly the joint office. And I really bring uh, a point of view from the shared mobility space where uh, for the last seven years or so, I worked at Lyft both on the ride share and uh, micromobility side of the house. Um, and I think that that's a really important perspective to bring uh, into the joint office as we think about helping everyone ride and drive electric um, and, and take sort of a, a broader definition of what is an electric vehicle because, hey, uh, you know, there's been a lot of headlines that have showed that actually one of the most popular uh, best-selling electric vehicles in the country right now is an e-bike. So let's make sure that as we build this EV charging network, uh, it works for a variety of EV users and a variety of uh, electric vehicles and form factors. Thanks, Debs. That's a great segue, and we'll stick with you. Um, everyone's provided a really great overview for what they're working on, but when you talk about future-proofing and creating a network where everyone can ride and drive electric. I just want to give you uh, a couple of minutes or a minute to kind of talk about the biggest one or two challenges that you're looking to tackle in 2024. Yeah, so I think um, a lot of these uh, challenges and opportunities really do coalesce at the curb um, where there's so many different transportation modes happening. Um, and that might be uh, thinking about how to install a curbside charging station for electric vehicles. But uh, that also means navigating um, pickup and drop off needs for uh, passenger loading, um, as well as, uh, you know, goods movement and e-commerce, uh, as well as other shared mobility modes like a car share station and bike shares and scooters. And so I think um, really diving into the curbside charging component and, and navigating some of those permitting uh, and policy issues, but then also designing it in a way that thinks about not just supporting um, EV cars and, and, you know, trenching to support that mode, but sort of this idea of a dig once phenomenon and, and taking advantage of all these other uses that are happening at the curb and trying to support that. That's something I'd really like to make progress on. Great. That's super helpful. Yeah. You mentioned a number of challenges associated with um, charging and uh, electrified mobility at the curb. So that's kind of the umbrella. Um, so that's super helpful. Um, how about you, Kevin? 
Yeah, thanks. I, I think the biggest challenge and opportunity is making sure that we're aligning incentives and actually addressing the right problem. Like, are, are, are we all playing the same game? Like, if, if this part of the market is playing tag and the other is playing soccer and the other is playing full contact American football, someone's getting hurt, right? Or we, we, we may all end up playing together, but it, it, we're mismatched. So how do we make sure that we look at all the tools in the toolkit, right, from thinking about um, are there uh, non-financial uh, uh, incentives that we could uh, consider? Are If there are going to be uh, financial measures that we're using to help overcome certain barriers uh, uh, for deployment and long-term operation of infrastructure in a variety of use cases, are we going to use the one that we've always used and just issue upfront funding? Or do we think through how can we be more flexible to create more joint value and create a more sustainable uh, glide path uh, so that the efforts that we do now, right, the appetite that we have now, which is to accelerate things. Because uh, up until now, the private market's been doing a lot of heavy lifting, um, and it's developed in one way. So if we want to accelerate it in another, we can't do it in a way that all of a sudden, if a program goes away, the rug gets pulled out from under it. So how do we think through using the tools to uh, accomplish our goals? Um, as well as ensure that they can continue to grow and scale as all evidence points towards, you know, naturally being the case anyway. So we can still meet all of our uh, goals uh, from an environmental, equity, jobs creation, uh, uh, economic development, uh, and technology transformation uh, uh, route uh, without uh, uh, distorting uh, the market or uh, losing out on opportunity, leaving value on the table. If we look at what the tools are that we can use and match them appropriately to the problems that we have in front of us. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and how about you, Sajal? Yeah, I, I mentioned, you know, decreasing the timelines for getting uh, EBSEs connected to the grid. Uh, another one uh, that I'd like to start diving into more this year is demand charges and being able to share some best practices I've already started to hear uh, from various territories uh, that policies as well as some regulatory happenings that could assist that decrease or, or that that burden that demand charges uh, right now, uh, barrier that demand charges are, are facing for EVSP providers. Um, and then there's technologies that could potentially assist with that as well. So I'd like to dive into that and see where we could assess from the federal side. Great, thanks to our senior advisors and Gabe, um, maybe just uh, interested in your thoughts on how that all aligns. We heard from Debs, um, about some of the major challenges coalescing at the curb. Uh, Kevin talked about how do we align the great work of all these programs for supporting with momentum in the market. And then Sajal was talking about um, improving timelines to deploy infrastructure, addressing demand curves and some of the technology solutions. Um, does that roll up with uh, kind of what you're tracking as big challenges for the joint office to address? Yeah, I mean, I think in some sense, um, the biggest risk is inertia, right? And inertia can be caused by a number of different challenges or problems. Um, for instance, we heard early on when the J3400 conversation was happen happening around the connector, like, should we wait? Should we wait to put out an RFP and, and sort of see how things shake out? Absolutely not. There is no reason to wait. Uh, we need to move as fast as humanly possible to get chargers in the ground. And what we did is we quickly went to work to figure out how much would it cost to switch out a connector or a cable and a connector. And it was a de minimis cost. We started relaying that back to states and uh, jurisdictions. So, you know, I think um, our job is to sometimes myth bust. Uh, sometimes it's to take um, maybe not widely known information and get it out to the masses uh, through events like this to be transparent and as open as uh, is possible. Um, and I think that, you know, I think we're gonna do tremendous things this year. Uh, I think a lot of chargers are going to go in. I think a lot of utilities are going to figure out some of their challenges. Um, I think we're gonna see cities really focusing, as Deb said, on uh, curbside and equity and making sure that people that um, uh, don't own a car uh, or don't own a parking space, have the ability to charge whatever vehicle they choose to, including uh, if they choose to just access a vehicle, maybe it's car sharing, ride hailing, 
uh, a bike or a scooter. So, um, you know, this is in some ways early on, we're in like the preteen years of um, um, electrification. And uh, we just hit almost 10% in sales. So we've hit that tipping point. Uh, we've got buses going out in mass now. And I think this is sort of the year of implementation, uh, the year of cities, the year of access, and the year of utilities sort of getting um, on board with the whole program. Not that they aren't on board, but figuring out some of those challenges because there's so many of them. And we're here. Hey, to thanks. That. Yeah. Yeah. Gabe, you mentioned the work that the joint office did to support um, the standardization of SAEJ 3400 and kind of um, how that timeline looks. Um, just a follow-up question here, uh, maybe for you or for Kevin, but um, the SAE published the J3400 as a technical information report. Um, does that give industry and uh, states enough information uh, to start putting that into practice? Um, or what do things look like there? Yeah, and yeah, so that, that TIR came out in December. Um, and now basically we're working towards a June deadline, right? Um, or at SAE is, I should say. And that's when it'll truly become uh, an open standard. Um, it started out that uh, Tesla, you know, open sourced the connector in November of 22. And then we at the joint office with Federal Highways put out the minimum standards that actually uh, allowed you to put a secondary uh, connector in at your station. And now, um, as this becomes the norm, and almost every OEM has jumped on board uh, with that standard, you'll start to see uh, adapters out at stations, really starting this month. Um, and, you know, when it becomes an actual standard in June, um, then I think you'll likely have most of the OEMs um, uh, with their plans in place for the 2025 uh, port on their vehicle. Um, so that's sort of the rough timeline. We have something a little more detailed that uh, we're working out on now. But again, we're, we're letting industry coalesce around what they want to do in their timeline. Um, we're also testing connectors. Uh, uh, I mean, testing adapters. Adapters were UL certified. So there's a lot going on on the adapter front because you've got, you know, 4.7 million EVs on the road and a good chunk of those are CCS vehicles. And again, our goal is not to strand anybody. If you have a CCS uh, port on your vehicle, we want you to be able to charge at any station. And if you have a J3400, you should be able to charge as well. Thanks, Gabe. I want to tr transition over to Sejal now. Um, Sejal, when you were talking about kind of big challenges for the year, you mentioned uh, timelines to deploying charging infrastructure on the utility side. We have a question here about transformers um, and that potentially uh, being a timeline consideration. Um, is that on your radar? And what is the joint office doing to help with uh, lead times for um, utility side equipment like transformers? Definitely on our radar. I think supply chain issues are are, are raised all over the place and, and definitely acknowledged. Uh, the uh, joint office is working with the DOE. There, there is a team of folks that are working on this problem from various uh, perspectives to try to address this. Uh, and I've heard that they're starting to lift off a little bit, but we are working on it um, and more to be shared in the upcoming months. Great, Sejal. And um, so you mentioned working with DOE. Uh, does DOE have funding available, or um, what's the what's the effort at DOE that's working to address um, the power grid side of the equation for charging? Uh, there is definitely funding available through the grid deployment office on the grid side. Uh, there is multiple uh, billions of dollars uh, from the GDO. Uh, there's also the loan programs office that is providing funding. Uh, financing for various projects and EV and EVSC projects are eligible there. Great. Thanks so much, Sejal. I um, want to turn it over to Kevin. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first one that thought maybe you might have um, some insight on is um, when folks are thinking about vendors, what types of organizations um, should they be looking at that could potentially help them connect with vendors and suppliers? Um, we'll start there. 
Wow, I, that's a, a, a seemingly easy question with a potentially limitless answer, right? So uh, it, it all depends, right? If you're talking about uh, someone who has a detached garage and you've got a day or so between needing to fully top off, you could do that with a low-powered level one, right? But if you uh, need to start thinking about having a charging infrastructure that can uh, not just uh, put out juice slowly, but also integrate with the grid. You might want to start thinking about ways that you're working directly with providers or that you're just uh, uh, looking through at, uh, you know, at big box stores who have stuff off the shelf to help get you home charging. But not everyone has two and a half kids, a white picket fence, and a detached garage. I, I grew up on the 23rd floor of a high rise. So I was not one of those folks. But, you, you know, if you're looking at commercial deployments and uh, you're trying to electrify your fleet, there are a huge number of stakeholders you should be talking to. Uh, the Department of Energy's Clean Cities program is a, a great place to start uh, to uh, get smarter on these issues. But if we're ever talking about doing larger scale deployments, the second you think about doing that, you need to start talking to your utility. In the future, we'll have a seamless ability to uh, uh, energize charging, install, have visibility into uh, queues for doing so. Uh, where we are now is we need to make sure that we do uh, as much advanced planning as possible. Uh, the last thing that anyone likes in life is surprises. So how can you make sure that you're partnering uh, with uh, the folks who are going to help connect your charger um, to uh, the grid to uh, minimize any lag times there? In terms of trying to find the right uh, match, you know, you've got to uh, ask yourself uh, some questions around uh, what type of services you're looking for, what type of granularity of data you need. And I think one thing you'll be able to do in the coming weeks is uh, rely on um, uh, uh, published information uh, from the Joint Office and uh, Argonne National Labs uh, to give a little insight into the different models for operating EV charging infrastructure uh, to help you understand what is it that you actually need. You know, uh, understand what is it that you're trying to do and accomplish. There's the right tool for the job. Um, if you are just providing workplace charging or if you're just providing charging for, um, you know, uh, in a multi-unit uh, dwelling environment, you may not need uh, that 350 kilowatt DC fast charger. And in fact, uh, you may get left out of the room uh, uh, if uh, you ask your HOA board to install one. Uh, so, uh, again, the right tool for the right job, and we're looking to make sure that uh, we provide the tools uh, to uh, the public and to stakeholders around the country uh, to make it easier to uh, ride electric, drive electric, haul electric, and uh, install infrastructure. Thanks, Kevin. I was going to ask you another question, but we're about out of time, and I want to give uh, Debs an opportunity to answer a question here that kind of builds on I your experience. Just, say, just uh, 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 really important, Debs put in a whole bunch of uh, plugs for it being the year of, uh, I think, the e-bike. I just want to clarify that 2024 is the year of the electric truck. Um, but that's a, there can be uh, many different things that uh, 2024 means to do. You can have both. Sorry, Debs, go ahead. Both ends of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. Tune in yeah. for our next webinar that we'll have a boxing match between uh, these different e-mobility modes. <laughs> oh, I, I might not mo want to moderate that one. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but Debs, uh, so Kevin was talking about growing up on the 23rd floor of a high-rise apartment. Um, nearly 40% of U.S. households uh, live in apartments and condos, but apartment owners and condo HOAs are often reticent to invest or allow EV charging or installation. So um, are there any plans at the joint office to develop incentives and programs to specifically address that market? Yeah, I, I think this is a really great question. Um, I would say stay tuned. Um, I mentioned a white paper that the joint office is going to be putting out soon on uh, best practices around multifamily housing charging. Um, and we know that there's a lot of room there um, on the technology side to get into best practices of what is the right fit there, um, but also on like the permitting side, um, you know, how, how can we speed things up? What kinds of building code amendments do we need? Um, the role of right to charge laws and, and other support um, to, you know, have EV make ready requirements for new developments or parking lots. So I think um, we're gonna be, exploring that a lot this year. And I'll also shamelessly make a plug for uh, one of our webinars that's going to be coming up uh, that will be focused on navigating uh, zoning and building codes for EV infrastructure. Yeah, and then of course the curbside EV charging strategies, um, which is also one of the major challenges you mentioned. So we've got a lot of great webinars coming up in February. We encourage you to 
uh, sign up for those. Um, we'll get information out of those uh, shortly. Um, and then Bridget, if you could advance to the next slide, please. I just wanted to um, encourage everyone, if you didn't get your question answered, uh, we do want to hear from you. So the best way to get in touch with everyone, including our senior advisors um, and Gabe, is to visit driveelectric.gov slash contact. Um, so I, I know there's still a few questions kind of waiting in the wings in our Q&A that we're not going to be able to get to. Um, but if you could please follow up with us um, via that contact form, we've got um, an army of uh, dozens of technical assistance experts that um, field those inquiries that are coming in on a daily basis and then providing responses. So that truly is the best way to get in touch with us and to get um, a rapid response within a couple of days. So um, again, visit the website, sign up for our newsletter. That's also an important way to stay current on um, information coming out on future webinars, funding opportunities, um, technical resources that were mentioned on this call. Uh, so I really wanna thank all of our senior advisors and Gabe uh, for, for leading the conversation today. Um, and we hope to see you again on a future webinar. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Steve.